like just a quick introduction amen uh we is you know as we have guests and visitors here tonight amen my name is uh Quantrell Trail for short my mom named me after the Quantrill Raiders of Lawrence Kansas everybody asked me that so <laughs> just a fun fact amen and this is uh Pastor Marlon Brown we've been married for 31 years we have uh, four glorious adult children and six grandchildren. Amen. Praise God. Amen. So we're not novices. Okay. We didn't just get married last year and trying to do this. I mean, we've been married quite a long time. We've been in ministry for probably hmm, 30, maybe 30. We, we started in our 20s. So probably about 30 years, I would say. You know, I, I started first, and then Pastor Marlin saw about 30, anywhere from 25 to 30 years of ministry. This ministry has been in existence since 2001, so what's that, 23 years? 23 years. Amen. And we've been in this building, can you all believe it'll be a year next week, next Sunday? It's, it's still a miracle that this is debt-free, completely paid for. Amen. God really was good to us. Amen. And so um, we wanted to uh, bring this forth. We usually do our faith and family weekends, and it's usually just around family topics and things like that. And so it's something that the Lord gave me many years ago. Amen. But this particular year, we decided to focus around... Uh, relationships, one for the singles, and then one for the married couples. Amen. Because, amen, these things are so very important. They're very important to God. Um, and therefore, I know they're very important to you. Amen. You want to have a long lasting relationship. You want to get it right the first time. Amen. How many can agree with that? We want to get it right the first time. Amen. And so we appreciate you all coming out here and um, letting us uh, speak into your heart. Did you want to say something? Okay. <laughs> All right. And so when I started Diamonds, the Lord said to me, the number one problem for a woman is typically a man, a male relationship is what he was talking about. And the number one problem for a man is particularly a woman. I mean, meaning that if the enemy wants to really wreck your life, Amen. He will send either a man or a woman into your life. Amen. It is the fastest way to tear your life up in one hit. Amen. Your mental function, your spiritual function, your physical function. I mean, how many of you know when you're not in a good, healthy relationship, all of those areas of your life are impacted? Amen. And if you come out of it, amen, um, in which we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight, amen, sometimes, amen, we're left with scars and traumas. Amen. And one of the things that I know is that, and I hear it all the time, amen, and it is, it is completely false, amen, is a lot of times we think that we've learned something because we know what not to do. Amen? You may know what not to do, but do you know what to do? Those are completely different things. Amen? And a lot of times when you don't understand the difference between not knowing what to do and not knowing not to do that, amen, you find yourself in repeated cycles. Amen? Because you really haven't learned what to do. I mean, how, first, before I go into that, what is the purpose of dating? How many of you uh, 
at some point or another, maybe not now, but eventually at some point or another, you're wanting to be in a, in a marital relationship. Okay. All right. Cause if not, you don't need to be dating. Okay. If you're not wanting to get married, you don't need to be dating. Amen. Well, you said correct. That's, that's the truth <laughs> because um, that's what you're supposed to do. To you, if you're not looking to be married and you don't want to be married, then what are you dating for? You just need a friend. Um, so I agree with Quantrill that dating is designed to lead to an end result. And so, uh, if you don't desire to be married to someone and you're dating, then you're really wasting the other person's time because you are, you've made a conscious decision of what you don't or what you do want, don't want to do, but the other person may not feel that way. Um, and so I don't believe in wasting each other's time. I, I, I just don't think that that's, that's, that's good. And the other reason is, is because, once again, the things that dating does and the things that dating opens you up unto puts you on a path that leads somewhere. So I do agree with you. Amen. So what is the purpose of dating? The great Miles Monroe said, when you don't understand the purpose of a thing, abuse is inevitable. Amen. When you don't understand the purpose of a thing, abuse is inevitable. Proverbs 16 and 4. Proverbs 16 and 4. How many of you know that's true? And that's in any area of life. Amen. If you don't understand the purpose of a lawnmower and you're trying to whack bushes, <laughs> you're going to mess up something. Amen. Proverbs 16 and 4 says, The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Amen. So, amen, the Lord has made everything for its purpose. Dating is not mentioned in the Bible per se. Amen. I want to make that clear. Dating in the, in the definition, the modern definition that we know of dating is not mentioned in the Bible per se. But the Bible has plenty to say about relationships. Amen. A positive. Now, I want you to think about this and I want you to listen to this really carefully. A positive dating experience lays the groundwork for a successful marriage. A positive dating experience lays the groundwork for a successful marriage. So the purpose of dating is to discern, and I said discern, a life partner. How many in this room are born again? Jesus is your Lord. Okay. So we go beyond what we can see, feel, hear, taste, and touch. Amen. We are people of faith. Amen. And so dating uh, is to discern not feel, see, hear, taste, and touch. We need to go beyond that. Amen? So it is to discern a life partner. Just stop me. Um, also here, if we really look at what she's saying, uh, I truly believe that when we're talking about dating, dating is an, uh, it's a time of, of exploration. It's a time of, of gathering and listening and learning. Uh, it's, it's a time to figure out whether or not you guys would be compatible. Uh, and that's important because Amos chapter 3 and verse 3 says, how can two walk together except they agree? Well, you need to find out. There has to be a season somewhere in there for you to find out whether or not you're going to be compatible with this person that, that uh, you're potentially uh, considering to, to, to spend your life with. Um, you want to figure that out before you say, I do. You don't want to figure that out after you've got married and you've lived together for a while and you finally figure out we have absolutely nothing in common. Man, I don't even think we really like each other. Well, you should have figured that out before you got married. You should have figured that out uh, before you got engaged. And so the time that's 
that's given in the dating process is for you to learn and for you to, to explore and for you to begin to see, uh, discern the things that she's saying here. And, and, and the thing that I find when we're talking about this particular area, the thing that I find is that instead of us going into it with that type of a mentality, we're going into it completely emotionally. And so when, if you're doing that, then you're going to miss a lot of things that, that you should have been able to see uh, right away. And then the other thing that James, I, and I want to read this here because there's something I want to bring out. In James chapter 1 and verse 19, now we're giving you scriptures because I want you to see that we're not really giving you just solely our opinions uh, because those are our opinions. But I want you to see what the Word of God has to say about certain things. And in James chapter 1 and verse 19, it says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear and slow to speak. Uh, <clears throat> When you're learning and you're exploring and you're trying to get to, to, to know one another, you have to allow time to listen, to hear what the other person is saying, and then pay attention to the things that you're hearing. Uh, in other words, you should be asking questions that are pointed. You should be asking questions that, that, that are going to lead to, to discovery. And you need to learn how to ask those questions in uh, multiple different ways, uh, because this is the time for you to 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 uh, be discerning and to be, and to be learning about your compatibility. You don't have time to be. This is not the time to be discussing all of your, you know, history and you know what your mama did to you, what your daddy did to you, and, this, and how many kids you had. This is not that time at, at this point. This is the time to really be digging into seeing what type of a character does an individual have. Uh, how do they think on core uh, issues that concern you in, in your life to see how well you guys are going to fit together, All right? So I, I intentionally said design because the proper progression in the dating experience should follow spirit, soul, and body. Yes, it should. Okay, that is the proper. Now, this is totally against, this is totally opposite of the world. I'm telling you that right yeah. now. I'm telling you that right now. The world has flipped it. But this, the dating experience should follow spirit, soul, and body when becoming acquainted. Now, we're talking about if you want a godly marriage or a godly partner, okay? Well, we should have started the whole thing off with this, with, with, with Romans chapter 12, because, you know, she said she didn't get there, but, but, <clears throat> This has become the issue with God's people. For some reason, we, we, we consult God on everything that is going on in our lives, but two areas, there's a tendency to back away from God because you either you, you don't like what he's, you, you know what he's going to say, or you, well, I don't know what the excuse is, but when it comes to people's money, there's a reluctancy to want to hear about what God had to say about them kind of have your own mind or you are you are conformed to the way the world does things in those areas because that's what you're used to you're used to going to work paying bills borrowing and all those different types of things so the world system when it comes to your money you, it's easy to go in that but when God starts talking to you about money it's completely opposite of what the world wants you to do sometimes it's hard on your flesh and the same thing is true when it comes to relationships in this area right here the people, people of God have assimilated, and, and honestly, when I look and you think about it, 100% of what their most people are doing, God's people, are following this tracking and following the same track that people in the world does. And if you're following the world's track and you're doing it the way that the world does it, and the Bible tells you not to be conformed to the world, or the Amplified Bible, one, of us, one translation says, don't be so quick to fit in how un, un, unto how they do things. Well, if you keep following their track, what do you think the outcome may possibly be? The same thing that you see going on in the world when it comes to relationships. So you have to attack it or, or approach it, I guess would be a better word, approach it 
in a completely different frame of mind if you want to find a different outcome. So the first step in the relationship should focus on the spiritual dimension, which is the most important. Because you are a spirit. When I'm talking to people, it is amazing how little this stance of I need to understand that person where they are spiritually takes. People seem to be more consumed in compatibility of intellect, compatibility of money, compatibility of everything else but the spiritual compatibility. And it is the most important because it often leads to the worst experiences when you don't understand this. And so righteous dating should be in right alignment with God and his standard and principles. And as Pastor Marlon said, the world and God's standards are completely opposite. And unfortunately, believers are more familiar and more comfortable in the world's way of dating than with the word of God. So, and it's usually only after a sexual encounter when couples begin to get acquainted. Now, I know all of us in here are probably experienced in dating or experiencing that, and that is absolutely the truth. Sex is 100% emotional and physical. Okay? Detrimental. And there really is no real deep, deep, deep spiritual spiritual bonding in it, especially if you're not married. It's purely 100% for your physical and emotional enjoyment. When it's done outside of the marriage, it is absolutely 100% a perversion, and it is absolutely 100% an entryway for the kingdom of darkness in your life. And we'll get there, but that's I want to say that right up front. And so the world, of course, which is head up by Satan. The Bible says that Satan is the God of this world. He absolutely wants to flip this around and get you sexual first. Because once you sexually connect, it's very difficult to break you apart because you are mentally, physically, and emotionally bonded. And that is why, and we're going to get there, but that is why sex is only permitted with a license under the need the protection of a covenant. Amen? So sex is exclusively for marriage. It requires a covenant because blood is involved. Amen? And covenants are very serious to God. So spirit soul and body one of the major reasons that this is is important see when we're talking about completely changing your approach once again the world approaches it from a physical emotional standpoint you are not of the world anymore you are of the kingdom of god your spirit man is alive and the reason that this approach is important is because the bible makes it very very clear that each and every one of us are to be led by our spirits, by the spirit of God, through, uh, led by our spirits through the spirit of God, not by your emotions and not by your physical man. Because when you're led by your spirit, you're able to keep everything in its proper perspective. When you get outside of being, see, you're, the John chapter 10 and verse 4 says, says it this way, 4 and 5. It says that that uh, my sheep recognize and hear my voice. How do we hear God's voice? We don't hear it with these natural ears. You don't hear it with your mind. You hear it with the, with the ears of your spirit. And if you're not approaching it that way, if you're not putting yourself in a mindset that this is what, this is how God is going to lead me down this path, then you're not listening for the things and the alerts or the confirmations that the Spirit of God is going to give to you because everything now is out of its proper perspective. 
And then it goes on and says, but my sheep recognize and they know my voice. And a stranger, a counterfeit, one of those men that came up out of the sewer that she talked about during Diamonds, you won't be tricked to follow. But if you're pulling this based on your emotional connection or a physical connection, then it's going to be very easy for you to be deceived. Why? Because the devil is the master of deception in that arena. And he will deceive you every single time. I promise you, he will. Whether you are a man or a woman. Because don't you sit here for one second and think that God, I mean, the devil don't have some females out there that, that, that he's using to, to trick you up as well. They're all out there. But this is why you do what she's saying. You have your spirit up front. I'm constantly listening. I'm constantly inquiring. Uh, I don't need to be in your face uh, every second, every moment of every day. I don't need to have you in my ear on the phone every second, every moment of the day. I need some time away from you to be able to consult with my advisor and to be able to hear what my advisor has to say about what I'm engaging in. Because there could be some things you're missing and the Spirit of God is like, did you, did, you, did you consider that? Did you hear this? Did you see that? And I'm not saying all on the negative. It could be some great qualities that you missed and you're not paying attention to. And the Holy Spirit may say to you, well, did you see this? Did you hear that? But if you do not put the Spirit first, then the perspective gets off. And you're going to miss a lot. Yeah. So the spiritual relationship is the first relationship two people should focus on when dating. Spiritual compatibility is the most important discovery. And the reason for that is this. Okay, we know according to the word of God, the man is the head, right? And the woman is the support, correct? Okay, so when I'm talking, me as a woman, if I'm talking to a gentleman, I need to, under because listen, God don't choose your head. Let me, let me say that. God does not choose your partner. There is not one somebody on this earth perfect for you. There are many opportunities, amen, that would match you perfectly. You make the choice. See, that's a myth. That's a myth that has been taught in the church, and that's a lie. God don't do the choosing. He does not. He does the advising, and, and, I'll, sh and I'll show it to you in Scripture. But... The reason you need to understand where you are spiritually is because you potentially might be my head. And that's going to be important. Or she may potentially be your support. And that's going to be vitally important. Amen? So anyone that cannot, hold on one second, anyone that cannot communicate on that level in a dating relationship is already off to a bad start. What she just said was powerful, and I don't want you, it to just go over your head. You think about all the work that God put into Jesus to free you, to free you from Satan's grips, to free you from his entanglement and his, his bondage. And then you turn around and go and marry or get, and if, uh, uh, for uh, uh, a female, you go and marry a man who now is going to become the head in that relationship because whether you believe it or not, they will have some, they, they will assume that position because that's what it happens and they're not saved. What just happened? The very thing that God has worked all through Jesus to free you from, you went and locked yourself back down to it. And if you are God, the very thing that the, that the Lord is trying to bring into your life as a helpmate, you went and locked yourself back down to the devil. You've went and reconnected and bound yourself right back to the very thing that God tried to free you from. And then there, here comes this idea, well, I'll pray and I'll get him saved. No, you won't. You have no guarantee. So let's talk about this word saved. Everybody has their own definition of salvation. Everybody is toting around the word Christian. Christian really means Christ-like, okay? 
So I need to understand where you are on a on a, a on a spiritual level, and I need to make sure we're on the same spiritual level. That our definitions of spirituality are the same. There are a lot of men, amen, that are saved that don't believe women have any say. There are a lot of women who are saved that believe they supposed to run the whole show. Okay? So I need to understand your biblical concept of what it means to be saved. Amen? Because salvation, when true salvation happens, it is a complete change of your character, your desires, your appetites. Amen? And so if you're saying you're saved, but you want to meet me on a date in the club, I'm going to have a problem. Well, that goes back to can you define for yourself what salvation means? Because if you can't define it for yourself, then how in the world are you ever going to be able to recognize it when you see it? So if you can't define for you what it means to be saved, I can, I can tell you what it means to me. Yeah, saved folks live by this. Amen. That's just what I'm going to tell you. You ask me any day of the week, this is what saved folk do. And when they find it in here, this is what we do. Now, anybody that's coming out, coming at me, if I wasn't married to Quantrell and, and I was out here in this world dating, which thank God I, I bought all y'all. But anyway, we going by the book. Because at the end of the day, this is what's going to judge my marriage. This is what's going to judge my relationship. So if I'm living this way, and this is my definition of salvation, and you telling me it don't take all of that, then our conversation's over. There's no need me to keep talking to you because we're, we're going to, at somewhere in there, our paths are going to separate. And you're going to keep me safe. That's true. You know, you're going to keep me safe. You're going to keep us safe. I'm going to keep you safe, and you're going to keep me safe from temptations. Because we believe the same thing. You're going you're gonna to already walk in that frame of protecting me. What did you say about that in the Christian family? You talked about how the man is supposed to now hunt. And women can come on to men just as bad. So don't think, I'm, don't think we're saying that. But I love what he said about protection. And when you're with someone who is saved like you saved, y'all been dipped in the same water, you know, per se. We both believe in Jesus Christ. We both, Jesus is the center of our life. We live by the word. Then the word talks about fornication and you're not going to be in, you're not going to try to force me to a sexual level and I'm not going to try to force you to a sexual level. We're going to keep each other safe because just as much as we're dating, we're also sisters and brothers in Christ. And... <laughs> Amen. I'm ready to say something. And this is where, because I believe, because when you go into the Word of God and you look at the Word of God and you find the, the functions of a man, a man's men were designed, one of the designs and functions of a man is to be a protector. Period. Now, if I'm going to be a protector of women and children or whatever, right now we're talking about women, even if the woman wants to get in the bed with me, if I'm going to be a protector the way God says I'm going to be, I'm going to make sure that I don't put her in that position to do that. Now, here's the other side of that coin. You can't lose your mind. Oh, he's so old because he didn't. And now, you know, you don't lost your mind. See, you got to do both because if you're not careful, let me tell you something, because I'm going to share a few secrets here, because I, I didn't grow up in the church. Men have figured out that they are used that the first couple of times most. to lure your guards. Most men. I, put that way. I can't say all. But they are used this to get you to lure your guards because, oh, you think, oh, he's such a, oh, this is a great guy. I met my knight in shining armor. And you just being set up for down the road. So you got to understand this, if this is period. So not only do, does he have to have a mentality that I'm going to be a protector, then you're also going to carry the mentality that I'm going to protect myself as well as protecting him. 
we both got to think the same way, which takes us back to why it has to be spirit first, then an emotional connection, and the physical stuff is 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 well, doesn't show up until way later. Yeah. Yeah. So, sex is very dangerous if it's not very in the dangerous. confines of very, the covenant. Very, very it really is. It has really messed up a lot of people. Amen. And you can probably contest to some of that. Think about all of the children who are born out of wedlock, all those problems that occur. There's a consequence for that. You know, I had my, um, and I'm just going to take a little, is the, is the Holy Spirit just leading me to take a little rabbit trail here. I, uh, I got pregnant at 16 and I had my child at 17. My mother and them did not throw me a baby shower. It was not a celebration. I didn't get a photo shoot. I went. I, I know I'm touching on some toes right now, but it wasn't celebrate. It wasn't a celebration. And and no, did the did that particular church or my mom or anybody put me down and make me feel shame? No. But from the look on their face, I knew that my world was about to change. Amen. Yeah. Well, that a celebration would have been approval, like something. This is okay. We're, you do, this is not okay. So we shouldn't be celebrating something that I'm not saying that something's wrong with you. I'm not saying that something's wrong with the child that's coming. But what the position in which this thing is happening is not a good one, and we shouldn't be celebrating it because once you start to celebrate that kind of stuff, it makes it easier for the next. Time. Because it's not, see, this is the problem back to what I said. We cannot copy the behavior pattern of the world. We have become too lax in these areas in the house of God. And this is why we see the exact same failed marriage failure rate in the church. This is why we see the exact same issues that we see going on in the church, in the world. It's going on in the house of God. The divorce rate that the world is having is happening in the house of God. The exact same thing is patterned just like the world. Why? Because this is what's happening. No, we don't celebrate those kind of things. We we should be saying, hey, okay, this happened, but let's not let this happen again. And here's why. And I have a whole lot to say in this area, but I don't know if she won't, if she's going to get to. It. Well, the reason that I brought this up is because for me, it it created a trauma. I didn't have the com confounds of a marriage. I didn't get to celebrate. It, the experience of the me and the father of my child and the protection and the joy and it created a traumatic experience and we're going to talk about the trauma of that and how that impacts your life it really does you don't think it does you know it does when it comes up when it comes up when you meet somebody and they may be a good person that's when all that trauma shows you found Oh, you sure do. He said, I sure do. First okay. Corinthians, first Corinthians chapter six. You got your Bible turn there. You need to look at this. Because a lot of times folks, y'all just old foggy. Y'all just don't want us to have any fun. Y'all just, y'all did all the stuff, made y'all mistakes. Watch me. See, hey, you don't need to go hit your head up against the wall to find out that it hurts just because I mine got hit and it hurt. If I tell you it hurts, it hurts. You learn from my mistake. But here's the, here is to me the number one issue that people, God's people miss when it comes to sex. Sex is designed, sex is designed, wasn't designed primarily just for procreation, mm -hmm. although that's a part. There is another function to sex that God built into sex for a reason. And you see it right here, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let me see what I want to start. Uh, let's start at verse 16. We'll read it from the Amplified Bible. Do you not know and realize that when a man joins himself to a prostitute, let's take out the word prostitute there and just says when a man or a woman fornicate, same thing. He becomes one body with her. The two, it is written, shall become one body flesh. Now, if you don't understand that, the very next verse explains it. 
but the person who is united unto the Lord becomes one spirit with him. The number one function of sex is, and the reason that God says it is to be held and confined to marriage and marriage only, the number one reason is not to create children. That's secondary. The number one reason is it causes two to become one. This is why when you find a person that's been married to, the, to a woman and, uh, or to a man, they've been married for a long time, you say, man, they, they, they almost look alike. They act alike. They think alike. What's happening? Sex is designed to cause you to have that oneness. Whatever's in that individual is transferred to you, and whatever's in you is transferred to that individual. This is why when you break up with the person you've been sleeping with, it takes a while for you to get them out of you. And some of you still haven't got them out of you. And the reason that is, is because of what I just read right here. You, you, you linked with them and you united with them. And it was never to be done outside of marriage because it does the exact same thing with the person you're sleeping with as a boyfriend it'll do the, or a girlfriend. It'll do the exact same thing there that it does in a marriage. And now you've moved on. But Slick Rick is still in you. Sleazy Sally is still hanging on. And you can't seem to figure out why I just can't seem to get rid of this person. Why? Because they're there. Now you're going to have to spend some time in the word, in the spirit, trying to ask in the Holy Spirit to help you strip back out of you the soul ties, if you want to call them, that you've built in there. And if you want to sit there and act like I don't know what I know exactly what I'm talking about, because we talk to people, and, we, and we've experienced it, and we've talked to people. And so when you don't understand that, and you stop and think about it, you don't slap around with four, five, six different people. You got four, five, six different stuff run all up around and through you, and you can't seem to f figure out what's, what's, what's the problem. That's, that's the huge problem. Well, that's the pull. That's the draw. That's the... You know, you hear people say, what is drawing? What? Why is I'm drawn to that? That's what that is. You haven't, you haven't had there. that disconnected. You haven't had that cleansed and disconnected. You just went on about your way, and you didn't get that cut off. You didn't fully repent from that and really get cleansed of that and really get that out of your soul because that's where it that's is. Where it's it is. in your soul, and your soul is your mind, your will, your intellect, your emotions and your imagination and so that's why when that song comes on you remember that person right because they all in your soul smell they smell right and so that's what that is right and so it's it's so important so let's talk about parameters of safety and dating because there is some parameters for safety i'm telling you if you do this right the first time you will live days of heaven on earth with your with your spouse because it works. It really does work. Let's, let's get out of this mindset that, that this stuff is old fashioned. Or outdated. Or outdated. Amen. It's not. The Bible says that there's nothing new going on in the sin. If it worked then, if he says it works, it works. But the problem is, is that we haven't been taught to believe that it works. And then trust the process the way God is, has presented it to work the way that he says it's supposed to work. And it doesn't really need you trying to, you know, add, sprinkle your little stuff. Amen. Yeah. All right. So number one, parameters of safety in dating. Dating is for the mature and completely healed. Dating is for the mature and the completely heal for those who have done the work. Because people and motives are discerned and estimated. And so if you're not completely healed and you're not mature, you will not discern correctly. Discerning means to judge astutely based on a standard. Based on a standard. So it's for the mature and the completely healed. Hebrews 5 and 14, Hebrews 5 and 14, the ESV version says, but solid food is for the mature, 
for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Romans 12 and 2, the ESV version says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. How did the Bible say that you test that? Discernment. 1 Corinthians 2 and 14 in the ESV version says, the natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God for they are folly to him and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. First Thessalonians 5 and 21 in the ESV says, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. That word test is translated discern. Yes, that is uh, 5 and 21, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 21. And uh -huh. notice, discernment is an operation of the spirit. Yes, it is. So this is why we said right at the, up at the very beginning, it has to be spirit, soul, and body. You, you you underestimate the value and the power of your spirit man. And if we would learn how to follow him a little bit better, he is one of the major things that 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 happens is he is a protector. The Lord you protects you through your spirit. Revelation comes through your spirit. Discernment comes through your spirit. Information, wisdom from God comes through your spirit. It does not come through your mind. It has nothing to do with your body. So if you do not engage the spirit, you're going to find yourself at some point possibly getting off soon. Okay, so dating is for the mature and it's for the completely healed. It's not fair for you to be dating somebody and they have to live through your trauma experiences and be judged as if they were the person that did what they did to you was the, that's all messed up. Okay. So we don't want to be there. Number two, clear communicator. So out of that maturity comes a clear communicator. Clear communication sets up realistic expectation. It's unrealistic to have expectations you've never discussed. A good communicator knows when to talk in articulate, succinct, easy to understand language. I need to make sure that I am intellectually communicating with you and not emotionally communicating with you, right? Just That's just a little tad bit about what I have, I'm not gonna say all men, but I'm gonna say with Pastor Marlin, okay? Men respond, Pastor Marlin, to facts, information. When you get emotional, it's a complete turnout. Just tune it completely out. You're doing too much. Okay? If you have to get completely emotional in the dating space, you ain't ready to date. You are an emotional wreck. That's ridiculous, and you're going to scare somebody off, and they're going to think you need to be in a mental ward. Because it should not be this deep on no date. And neither one of you should get offended <laughs> if you start talking about things and the other individuals just says to you, this is mature, it's kind of grown folk talking, right? They say, you know, I'm just not ready to discuss that. And that's okay. Because maybe this, is, this isn't the time to just, because sometimes we can be moving a little too fast. And, and a person is not ready to divulge that kind of information just yet because I'm not quite sure that you are trustworthy to hold that kind of information just yet. Give me some time. Now, if we've been dating for, for seven, eight months and you don't want to talk, we got a problem because by now we should be comfortable with each other enough to understand something. And oh, by the way, 
I'm going to add this in here. And I, now I don't have a scripture and verse for this, but this is a good rule of thumb. You don't date forever. You need to put a time frame on there. After a year, you should be understanding whether or not we're going somewhere. After a year, we should be ready to move on. Because prolonging things out, you could, you could be missing out on an opportunity down the road because you're over here playing around, waiting around. Now, I've seen people. How long y'all been dating? Well, I've been waiting for him to ask me to marry him for, I've been waiting for her to, what? How long? It's been five years, six years. You don't know by now whether or not you want to be with me, and it's six years later, then you don't want to be with me. So set some some and, and agree. You know, we we had an individual one time. I I was uh, talking with an individual, a grown man. And the reason I say he was a grown man, the way that he came to me as the pastor of, of this church, he sat down. He says, "I just wanted to come talk to you, and I wanted to share with you that this is some, you know this this and this and this." And I just wanted to let you know I want to make sure that I was respecting you as the pastor of this house. And he says, now, uh, I'm going to give this thing, if you don't mind, one year to find out whether or not this is going to work. And if it doesn't work, then, you know, I just want to let you know. And then that a year went past, and that individual came back and sat down with me and, and explained to me what happened. And he just said, why? I mean, respectful. And, and But he was a grown man. That's what grown people do. They don't string people along. Amen. Amen. So you need to be a clear communicator. James 1 and 19 says, let every, you need to be a good communicator. You need to know when to talk and when to, when listen. to listen. You don't cut people off when they're talking and you don't insert stuff. You need to give that person a chance. What did I say? Dating lays the groundwork for marriage. You have to use the same communication style when you get married. Okay, so James 1 and 19 says, Let every man be quick to hear, a ready listener, slow to speak, slow to take offense, and to get angry. Yes. Okay. I hope you're writing your questions down if you have any, because we're going to give you time for, for questions. All right. And don't assume. If you don't understand what's being said, don't assume this is what that person meant. Ask. One of the things is it just on her own. She we could be talking and she got this thing big. Um, I'm gonna need an example. <laughs> yeah, an I example. need an example. Absolutely. <laughs> but it sometimes is irritating, but I understand why she's doing it. Because you don't want to assume because you could assume wrong. So if you're having a conversation and you didn't understand something before you get in your feelings, find out. Communi this is what communication does. Find this is what it's about. Because you haven't communicated if you didn't get an understanding. You just heard something. Mm -hmm. So you have to take the time. This is why we say this is for adults. You have to take the time. I didn't understand what you just said. Can you give me an example or explain it to me another way? And if the person is frustrated because you're asking to do that, then we got a communication problem right now that, that this could be a deal breaker right now because if this is the way we're going to act and we're just dating, what the heck is going to happen when we get married? I don't understand something. So don't assume that you knew what they were saying and then make a decision on an assumption that could be wrong. And remember, I said it's unrealistic to have expectations you've never discussed. So when you're dating, this is my example. See, see, I give examples. I'm just an example girl, right? So I give examples. And that is a rule of thumb. You need to give examples because both of you come from two different backgrounds. A green cow could mean something different to me than it does to you if you live in the city and I live in the, in the country, right? So we need to understand what what we're talking about. So here, here is an example of that. Here is what it will cost you to be in a relationship with me. Here are my expectations. Here are my boundaries. Because relationships do cost something, right? This is mature. That's what did I say? Dating is for mature people. 
right? So we're able to sit down and articulate. This is how long I plan on dating. This is my intent for dating. I don't want to waste your time. I don't want you to waste my time. We're not just going to see where this goes. We're not just flowing. And depending on your age, you really ain't trying to just be flowing somewhere, right? Right? You ain't 17 or 19. I mean, you 40. I ain't trying to flow. I need to know where we're going to go. <laughs> Amen. See, these are back to that, what I said <laughs> earlier, your questions are pointed. They're there for you to learn, for you to see compatibility. See, these are grown folk conversation. And, and if you can't have this kind of conversation on this level, then you're not ready to go into a serious relationship that's headed towards marriage. Because this is serious conversation. And you just don't say, well, here are my parameters. No, but it should come up in your conversation. After, after we don't date it once or twice, you ought to be clear on a few things that are going to be deal breakers with me. You should be clear. No, we're not headed to a bed, so don't ask me that. And so that should be clear. There, and, and if you haven't established certain things early on, see, I'll put it this way. People res will respect you to the degree that you demand that respect. And if you don't demand the respect, then don't be upset when you get disrespected. So, you know, we dating, and you got upset and called me a B? Whoa, 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 whoa. No, we just had a problem. So pump the brakes right here. Because, first of all, that's not my name. Second of all, lose my number. Because if you don't have enough sense, see, but or see, the you, other way around. or the other way around. Mm -hmm. You gotta be able, but see, this is why we walk by the spirit and not by our emotions. Oh well, he was just mad. Yeah. See, that's an emotional decision. Mm -hmm. That that's not that's not a spirit is decision because what just happened there was the Holy Spirit poked him and let you see some things that's wrong with the character. But if you're not walking by the spirit, you missed all that because you made an excuse for it. The next thing, accountability is a must. When you're dating, because it can lead to physicality and things like that, you should be accountable. You need, a, you need to be accountable to somebody. This is not the time to go into hiding with who you're dating. Plus, you need a fresh set of eyes, right? So Proverbs 15 and 22 says, where there is no counsel, purposes are disappointed. But in the multitude of counselors, they are established. Amen. I'm going to say this while she's looking for the next thing, too. Um, you have to be honest with yourself in this, in this uh, area and with the parameters. You have to be honest with yourself. Now, what do I mean by that? If you know you are that individual that has a problem with controlling your flesh, especially when you get into an, an intimate setting or, 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 or some type of whatever it is, and you have a problem with that, you got to be honest with yourself and know that that's a weakness that you have. And I say that to say this this way. And this may sound, I know we're talking about dating, and this may sound like a contradiction to that, but it's not. I think it's wisdom because I know the God that I serve. And if you are that individual and you know you can't handle that and you can't handle yourself in these kind of situations, then maybe you ought to tell the Lord, look, I, I, you know I can't handle this. You know this is an issue for me. I'm, we're working on this. I can't date like this. And you need to be asking the Lord to help you bring the right person to you. And I believe that the Holy Spirit will do that for you because you're you're taking an approach to say that I'd rather be safe than sorry. I can't, and I know I can't handle this. So there's no need of me even trying. So Holy Spirit, I'm, I'm working on it, but while I'm working on it, help me. And I want to be married, so I'm going to need for you to assist me. And I just wanted to add that in there because there may be some there 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 may be a time where you just have to say well lord you know i don't i just need for you to do this for me help me and i believe the grace and the mercy of god is there because you're being honest with yourself and you're being honest with god uh ephesians chapter 4 verse 27 said don't give any place to the enemy 
And if you know that's a weakness, then you just gave him an, uh, uh, an area to shoot at you. All right? So. so let's just do a quick debunk of the modern myth. Friends don't sleep together. Yeah, that movie was fake. Ain't no friend. The benefit is that I'm your friend. <laughs> that other benefit is for my marital partner. So you can't, when, once you start sleeping together as friends, it's over. Somebody, you can't say, well, I, you know, I told them. I told them. It, it, it don't matter what you told them. The emotions are involved. That's why you've been dating for five years and can't see you. Like we married, we, we do, we be married, we married stuff right here. These things are pri these things are privileges yes. for marriage. Stop giving away marital privileges to boyfriends and girlfriends. They have not earned the right to receive those things from you. So you know I had a guy tell me one time, he got so mad at me because the young lady was asking me my advice and she was saying the guy wanted her to be doing all this cooking and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, uh, no, that's for your husband. That's not for a boyfriend. You know, you shouldn't be doing that. And he got mad at me and said, well, if she can't show me that she's a wife by cooking, then she ain't going to be cooking and other things, I might add. Then I ain't going to marry her. Well, then I guess you just ain't going to get married. So I would have been like, thank you, bye. No, that, it, but the reality of it is, how wonderful will it, would it feel that you are with a fellow believer. Now, you may have had a, a sexual past or something like that, but when you got saved and born again and you're with another fellow believer, I have saved myself and all the privileges that come with me, I have saved and preserved them for you and you only. How would that make you feel? Amen? You don't have to have mental images and pictures of other people I done slept with all around this town and how many people in this town have seen me nude. Right? Am I? And now we grown, right? Correct? Amen? So the thing, and, and let me say this, I had a singles conference one time and people couldn't even determine if they were single. Listen, if you're not married or engaged, you're single. That's just it. And you're dating. Well, if you engage, you truly ain't married. You ain't married, but it's it's a it's an experience higher than dating. It's higher than dating. Than Amen. Dating. All right, so accountability is a must. All right, here's another one. Oh, a big one. Unequal yokes. Okay. An unequal yoke is not the same as incompatibility. I need to say that. An unequal yoke means of a different kind. So incompatibility is one thing that you should be you should be looking for, you should be detecting. The unequal yoke is a spiritual thing. It means of a different kind. The scripture for that is Deuteronomy 22 and 10. Deuteronomy 22 and 10. You shall not plow with an ox, a clean animal, and a donkey, an unclean, together. So this gives a picture of these two animals of unequal strength pulling each other apart because they're going opposite. The unbelieving partner will ultimately try to pull the believer from God, whether intentional or unintentional, because they serve a completely different master. There's only two. You, there is no human being on this earth that is solo. We are connected either to God, human, the human race. Every individual on this planet is either connected to God or they're connected to Satan. There are only two that you can be connected to. You're not somewhere independent of yourself. And so this unequal yoke talks about the believer being yoked up in a relationship with an unbeliever. The believer's master is God. The unbeliever's master is Satan. And somewhere in there, I don't care how happy they may look or how happy it may sound, somewhere in there, 
somebody's compromising. And the person that's usually compromising is the one on God's side because you were disobedient to God in the first place. So you're, I don't care what you say. There's only, like she says, only two systems, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God. There's only two. And once you compromise and go over there, you're going to have to continue to compromise to stay happy because the devil is never going to compromise your way. Mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 15 says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership can righteousness have with wickedness? Or what fellowship does light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial, which is Satan? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Ephesians 2 and 2, it says, now this, now this, is, this is the... the mind of the unbeliever in which at one time you walked habitually you were following the course and fashion of this world were under the sway of the tendency of this present age following the prince of the power of air you were obedient to and under the control of the demon spirit that still constantly works in the sons of disobedience the careless the rebellious and the unbelieving who go against the purposes of god so when you're with an unbeliever, it's enmity. It's, it's enmity, and, and, and I saw it. That it's worse than, enmity is a stronger level of hatred than just hatred. So when you are with an unbeliever, one, that, that Belial, Satan, is trying to take control because he is an enemy of God. Yes, Brother, Sh Brother Shelton. So that's okay. So the, the yoke is regarding salvation, right? repentance i'm sold um my life is is given to christ um you know living a life for christ the incompatibility is i i don't believe like you believe i don't believe in attending church i don't believe in tithing i don't believe in see those things are incompatibility the yoke is really the base form of salvation so if i'm a person okay I'm, a, I'm the co-pastor, okay? Just say Pastor Marlon wasn't here. Now, I can't go and marry somebody that's just a de deacon, just got saved, or some, uh, some new believer. That's not going to work. We're not spiritually compatible. We, but we may have the same yoke, but the other problem in that marriage is going to be I'm more mature spiritually, and I'm going to have a problem. So a good way to understand that would be this. You could take two trucks. I did this. I was driving uh, a vehicle for the city of Kansas City, Missouri. And the vehicle that I was driving, I'm trying to, it was a gasoline powered vehicle, unleaded fuel. And so I was in a rush one day. And instead of, and, and, and if you know you're on a regular car, you can't put a diesel, uh, gas thing in your thing because it's not big enough. But on the bus, it's just one gigantic pole. So I was in a rush and I grabbed the diesel fuel and I began to, I filled the bus up with diesel fuel. Now there was like a quarter of a tank of gas there, or maybe a half tank, but on top of that half tank of gas was all diesel fuel. Uh, so we drove for a while, then the bus started doing all kind of crazy stuff and it stopped. Why? Both of them were fuel. They were designed to do the same thing, but they were incompatible because it required, if I wanted the full operation of this bus, it required unleaded gasoline. I put diesel fuel in and it caused a problem. So the same thing is true in a relationship. You both can be saved, but if I don't believe the way you believe, we're going to have a problem because you want to go to church. I don't. You want to tithe? I don't. I don't listen to that kind of music. I don't see the problem with it. I do. 
well, I don't think our kids should do this, but I ain't nothing wrong with that. So it's going to still cause a problem. So just because you're dating a saved individual and you know they're born again, this is why we're dating. You're, this is, you know, we, we already dealt with whether or not we are equally yoked. You're born again, I'm born again. What are we, are we walking the same, to the same drumbeat at the same pace? Because if you're not, I promise you somewhere in there, you're going to have some issues because you may love Jesus, but you guys aren't, somebody's going to be unhappy in this relationship because we're not going at the same pace. And you have no right to require them to speed up. Just like they don't have a right to require you to slow down. You have to determine that. All right? Okay. So the yoke question, how do you, remember I said the first, the first step in the relationship is to understand that spiritual connection. So how do I determine this yoke first? Because that's the first thing that's the most important. The spiritual connection is the, is the most important right it's the the first important the compatibility issue follows under the soulish man okay so the spirit part what about that has he or she entered a personal relationship with the lord jesus christ of faith repentance and is there evidence of that in their behavior and lifestyle okay so you should take all the time you need to learn where each other stands in the matters of faith worship commitment to holiness and righteous living as believers. If you cannot agree at the spiritual level, you will have problems at every other level. We've seen it time and time again. Time, you think oh, in the in the 20 something years we've been in, in this church, managing this church, and in the 30 something years we've been married, we haven't seen all this type of stuff. We've seen stuff that would just make y'all pass out. People trying to put stuff together Anything that's that's not following the word of God is doomed to failure. Just doomed. Amen. So here's some of the rationale we've heard of dating and marrying unbelievers. Here's some of the rationale. When we get married, they'll change. They don't. When you get married, the, you, you relax. You don't have the married people in here to tell you that, but that's the truth. When you're dating, you're on your best behavior. When you're dating, I only see you, what, maybe once or twice a week on a date or I call you or talk to you or something. I can talk a whole bunch of stuff over the phone, right? We've, te we've mastered texting and Instagramming and Facebooking and all that kind of stuff. Oh, he sent me hearts and she oh, sent oh, me Oh, poo-poo letters, right? Mm, kisses, right? <laughs> Amen. And so when you get married, there is no, I mean, you got to see me every day. You're going to see me moody, up, down, all of that. Amen. So you can't change people once you marry them. I'm telling you right now, you might as well give that up. It ain't ever going to happen. It's not going to happen. And it's absolutely insulting. No grown person wants to be made over like a house like a remodeled house. It's, it's insulting because when you met me, this was me. This is me, right? So do not ever think that you're going to change somebody. And I'm going to jump ahead because I feel the Lord sent, telling me to say this because this is women, this is false realities amongst men and women about changing someone. And really where I have seen this happen the most, women are just infamously guilty of it. Because we, all, we always tend to skip over all of the, the, the problems and we start fantasizing about other stuff that ain't no reality. And when you dating, you need to face the reality. You need to face the reality of who you're dating, not the potential. I got I to gotta tell women that, men, just one second with the women. Y'all got to get off this potential stuff. You need to see who you're dating for who they are, okay? Because that's who you're going to be with. And when they show you who they are, believe, believe them. All right? So, men, when I was 
studying this and talking about it, this this is this is what the Lord said to me. Y'all, y'all can agree or not. Men then tend to think their strength overpowers spirit. And I've talked to men who think they can change a woman. Nope, you cannot, right? So men tend to rely on their strength and they think they have the upper hand in changing the woman because they're the head. No, this is a spiritual matter. So neither one sees that the one who compromises is the weaker and the weaker is ruled by the stronger and the devil requires submission. So bowing down and compromising is just that. It's submission to the enemy. Whoever it is that is compromising the word of God and God's standards, you are the weaker. This is a spiritual matter. It's not a gender matter. Amen? Okay. So I'm going to change him. Or I'm her. going to change her. What you're saying is I'm getting ready to manipulate them. That is the truth. That's and true. And the moment you step over into that arena, now you're in the operations of Satan. Because he's the only manipulator. You find that in Genesis chapter 3, how he manipulated Adam and Eve, and you see the end result of that. The Bible said that God is the one who will make you what you ought to be, equip you, and all of these things. It is not your responsibility that I'm going to marry them, I'm going to change them. So what you just said, you and the devil are going to partner up and beat on this person. And I'm going to tell you right now, nobody wants to be a project. I'm not your project. I'll tell you in a minute. You know how we know this? Because this is how we spent the first five years of our marriage. And it's, ama- it's amazing we even still together because we beat up on each other all the time. I told you, I, you know, most folks hang their guns up when they get home. We picked ours up at the door and we came in blasting because I'm going to make you know I'm going to make you. And this is how we did. And, but what we didn't understand was she's trying to manipulate me using the word, using this, I'm trying to manipulate her, I'm the head of the house and you're going to mind, and we all just going back and forth. And the devil's tearing up everything. Why? Because we're in his operation. I am who you marry. You are who you marry. You know how I learned this? I went to the, the first lady of the church that I was in. We were in. I love that lady. But she didn't cut me no slack. Now, she may have it's easy on other folks, but she didn't bite her tongue with me. And you know what? You know, because she was the one that laid hands on me and got me born again. And so she she took to me as a spiritual mother. And so I went to her one time and I was telling her, I had tears in my eyes. I mean, I'm boo-hooing. And I'm telling her about this, she this and she that. And she said, shut That's just that loud. And I did this. And she said, she was that way when you married it and you knew it. Now, what you going to do? I was like, what the heck? In other words, ain't no need of whining about it now. You knew that before you got married. See, this is what I'm saying. We know things, and you, you clearly see things, and the Spirit of God has shown you things, and you pass on by. You know why you pass by? Because you're either physically involved or too emotionally involved. Uh, invested and you're to the place to where you feel if I let him go I'm going to lose no if you let him go you're going to save your life and so this is this is what you you and you have no get here's the other thing I'm going to pray and like you're going to manipulate God I'm going to pray and get God to work God can't make nobody do anything he does not make anybody do anything You have no guarantee that that individual will ever change. You have no guarantee that individual will come to the Lord. You have no guarantee about nothing. This is why you need to be listening to God, praying and dating uh, wisely on the front end, learning, having these conversations, these topics, these things that Kwan Chara talked about earlier. What are your non-negotiables? You need to know what those are. You don't need to be figuring that out. You should know what those things are going in. And those are your red flags. Whoa, 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 whoa. And when you start seeing those things, now, hey, this is, this is, these are deal breakers. Well, maybe, no. Let me see. Things, non-negotiables are deal breakers. Other things that, you know, that aren't in your non-negotiable category, 
those things may can be worked out. But if there's just things that you know you are not going to be able to handle, then there's no need of you staying in that relationship if they're present. Because you're wrong to try to manipulate that individual to change it. You're wrong. Your kids don't even like you when, they, when you're doing it to them, do they? Now, what makes you think a grown man or a grown woman wants it? Man. So that was one rationale. He or she's been hurt at church. Okay, you've been hurt at work, but you go every day. Every day. <laughs> I'm so tired of hearing that. And look at the one that hurts you. I am so tired of hearing that. You go to work, and it, you, you work with 10 people, and probably two of them like you, but you go every day. <laughs> Excuse. He or she doesn't want to be a hypocrite. Excuse. I don't want him or her to get frightened if I talk about Jesus too much. If he or she gets afraid about you talking about Jesus too much, they're not the right partner. <laughs> he or she is still, this, I hear a lot of this. He or she is still working on some things. Nobody is perfect, not even me. You know what that says? That says I'm going to lower my standard. I'm going to lower down. Don't you want somebody stronger than you? Think about that logically. Don't you want somebody stronger than you? You're going to need somebody stronger than you. Um, he or she's not a Christian, but, they sh but he or she is sure nice. Even nice people don't make it into heaven without Jesus. Amen? Now, I, I really want to talk. Can I, can I oh, yep, yep, that you yep. Put it on the yes, time? yes. Okay. I really want to spend some time here. This is, I, I shared this a little bit with you all on Sunday that when the Lord was talking to me about doing this, he said to me, my people need to, in, in the area of relationship, you got it. Go ahead. I learned this from Quantrill, and I've adopted it, and I think it's wisdom. You don't, when people make the mistake of marrying people where they are today, you don't really want to marry somebody based on where you are today. You want to be looking into your future because you're going to grow up. And see, it may be cool. We kicking it now. He sits on the couch and she sits on the plays video games. She done this and then he. And all that stuff is cute now because you're 21. It's cute now because you're 25. You're not going to be 21 and 25 all, all your life. So what are your ambitions? In? What are your goals? Where do you see yourself? These are questions that you should be talking. Where do you see yourself in the next 10 years? If you can't answer that, then then then. That's me in 10 years with you. And we both stuck. Where, do, where, where are we going? Where are you going? Because if it's, a, if, if it's a woman asking a man that, you're getting ready to be my leader. Where are we going? Mm -hmm. If I'm a man asking a woman that, and I want to know because I want to make sure when I start making money, you ain't trying to spend it all. You're going to be there trying to help build this thing. See, we gotta, you got to be looking at the, the present as well as your future because both of those are going to come into play. You are going to live your future more than you are going to live in your past. That's the truth. That was really good. I appreciate like that. that. See, that's why I married you. <laughs> right there. Amen. Amen. That was really good. Amen. You want to be looking, you spend more days in your future. I'm going to steal it. I'm going to steal that. Okay. I want to talk about trauma. The Lord said to me, my people need to be healed from their trauma. Uh, and for this, God knew who was coming, right? And what's happening is you're trying to enter into relationships and enter into dating experience and you're traumatized. And you ain't even dealt with it. Because in a dating relationship, it's just we're done, it's over, and then you go on. For some people, it takes five, six years, seven, eight years to break from that get all that out there so your spirit man is fine it's your soul that needs the healing right so trauma results from constant persistent exposure to an incident or a series of events that are emotionally disturbing or life-threatening with lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning 
and mental, physical, social, emotional, and or spiritual well-being. That's what trauma is. So what are you saying? When you are dating and you don't, you know, before you came or before you got this information, you are dating one person after the other person, after the other person, after the other person. There's one let down after the other let down after the other let down. You slept with them all. It's, it's one let down after another, after another. We have good nerve to say they were cheating. They were not cheating because you're not married to them. They can do what they want to do. It's not cheating. I know somebody want to throw something at me, but it's not. Okay, you don't have no covenant with me, so I can do what I want to do, right? So you have one traumatic, because being in a relationship, all of you shows up emotionally, mentally, physically, men too, men too, men just as much as women, right? And then you have one crazy woman after another crazy woman, and the one that now is crazier than the first woman, and then you got another crazy one. Those things traumatize you. All right? So that's what I mean. According to Dr. Avery Jackson, who is a born-again neurosurgeon, trauma becomes incorporated in the soul, mind, will, and emotion. So the soul is the mind, will, emotions, intellect, and imagination. It can have long-term detrimental consequences if the reasoning part of the brain doesn't put the experience into context and then convert it into useful energy to deny any of our tripart being due to our feeling wronged, setting aside the truth of that feeling leaves us unsettled. It can leave our emotional, spiritual, and mental lives in shambles. And we often live irrational, fearful lives while denying that our spiritual, emotional, and physical selves require loving connectedness and positive reinforcement. Listen what he says. Satan then uses these loops of negative mental processes in an attempt to discourage us and to separate us from God, and it's an effective strategy. We are often quick to believe the worst possible scenario. When something goes wrong, we begin to question our abilities, our relationships, and everything else. We become discouraged and even question God's love for us. And only God can heal this, and you must receive his healing to overcome this. So what happens is when you are, when you have unresolved trauma, we, you know, people call it pain and all this kind of stuff. When you have unresolved trauma, the enemy creates a delusional loop. And you know, you know a loop, you know how you play them songs over and over. That's a loop. He creates an, an unrealistic loop. And then everybody that you meet is judged by that loop. And then certain behaviors or certain things or certain ways the person moves or certain things the person says causes triggers. And then it causes you to draw back. Amen. And then you you potentially mess up something good or then you potentially, you create a pattern. And you start judging that individual as if they're the one that hurt you. And they can't, they have, and, and they have to walk on eggshells around you because every little thing that they do has nothing, does, they may do the exact same, say something, or just, it doesn't mean that they're that person. It doesn't mean they're going to respond the way that other person responded. But when you are not whole and not healed in an area, that triggers in you a defense mechanism, and you go into this reclusion or you go into this walled-up area, and you start to fortify yourself to, to do what you do to protect yourself. But what you're doing is you're isolating yourself, and you could be missing out on something that's great, because you're judging them as if they're the other person. Now, let's talk about children who are in or who who are caught up in your, you know, your experience. You have children and you're dating. Your children should not be introduced to your dating folks until this is going to be a permanent 
decision and we're going to get engaged and we're, we're going to walk down this aisle and I know this. Because children, amen, attach to people, right? Emotionally, mentally, physically, and it's traumatic for them to see somebody else every three months or ever, however often it is, right? And it's especially dangerous to have your children calling your partner, mama or daddy, and y'all dating. No, you need to protect your children's physical and mental, mental status, right? Amen, amen, we need to protect our children, right? And so unless I know that, unless I know for sure you gonna be my marital partner and we're in agreement with that, and I've had that revelation about that, amen, then I'm not introducing you to my children. You don't, you don't need to know anything about my children. Amen. You know is that I have children, that's it. Correct. Their names are not important to you right now. Uh, how old they are isn't important to you right now. I have children. Now, as we date and we come to the conclusion, like she said, we're going to be engaged and we're serious about this and we know, then, yeah, now it's time for you to, you know, to introduce them to your children. Also, it's time to introduce them to your to your family. You don't need to be bringing every time you get a girlfriend, mm -hmm. boyfriend, they, mm -hmm. they come from to the, the family picnic. Why? Mm -hmm. Please. Why? Please. You don't need to be here? I don't know for sure you're even going to be around next month. So why am I bringing you to the family picnic? Okay. Patterns. Relationship trauma can cause blindness to choice patterns. Most people who suffer from relationship trauma feel safer in abusive or subpar relationships because they know what to expect. It is extremely demonic because it is a delusional state of mind. Trauma causes you to be in a delusional state of mind and you keep picking the same trash over and over and over. You need to take some time and be healed. And you good, know good and darn well you ain't got no business being in no relationship. Well, I wrote down Amen. for that. What I wrote down for that. that. You need to come to the place to where you ask yourself, true question why do i keep ending up here you're gonna have to ask yourself that question why because if you keep the it's the same buster in a different suit how do i keep ending up because it's not by chance there is something if 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 i get on the road and i keep ending up on 39th street that didn't just happen somehow i keep getting on a road to take me to 39th and i need to know how do I keep ending up here? And until you can answer the why question, you're going to keep ending up there, which takes us back to why it has to be a spiritual thing first. Because if you really want to know, the Lord will tell you. He's been telling you. You just wasn't listening. So out of trauma, then we're talking about attractions and personal tastes. Why do men and women say they want something good, but then and can't see them when they show up, it cannot see them when they show up. So out of trauma then is birth perverted appetites. Now, perverted appetites, I don't want you to freak out, I want you to think about this. Every one of us in this room, before we met the Lord, we were where? In the world, acting like the world, doing everything the world did. All of your attractive attractions and your your kinds and your taste and all of those things where were they all forged see do you stop and think about that that attracts to you where was it forged the the drinking and getting high and then having sex and this and that, all that stuff was forged in a demonic perverted lake you cannot bring that red wagon over here with you because if you do, you, I'm going to let you say something before I say something else, because I'm going to say some stuff. So if you are living in a false mental delusion, then all of your senses, the enemy has to twist all of your senses in order for you to remain in that condition comfortably without detection of its falsehood.
So the reason that you can't pick it up, that you're just seeing the same person, the same person, the same person, the same type of individual over and over and over and over, male, female, is because you haven't dealt with that trauma because then out of that trauma then comes those appetites and all that kind of stuff. And so what the enemy does is he keeps feeding that. Remember that loop? He keeps feeding that loop so to the point you're not detecting it because you're not walking in discernment you're walking in trauma amen okay go ahead you, oh, do we need to sit down you're being led <laughs> you're being led you're being let's just be honest when we meet somebody let's just be honest when we meet somebody the first initial thing is always physical but you have to have enough sense to understand that i'm gonna have to shut that put that goes on the back burner let me bring you back over to the spirit now, because if you don't, this is why you keep picking the same thing over and over and over again, because you're moving based on your flesh and your flesh only. Now, Quantrell, we were having this discussion at, at home, and uh, the discussion was that because I was like, you know, you know, people be picking me. That's about it. He, they, he ain't my type. She ain't my type. And I say, well, that's terrible because most of the people that say that their types were forged in the world. So do they really know what their real type is? And then Quantra said, well, you married your type. I said, and I got to thinking about that because I couldn't answer it. Because she's, she's right. And I couldn't answer that. I just blessed you. That's what that was. He favored you. I couldn't you. answer that. Well, they answer the same thing. But then the Lord answered me this week. And I'm going to give you the difference, the difference between how things worked for us and how they could have worked if it was just a little bit different. When I met Quantrell, and I want you to follow me, she was saved, I was not. All right? When I met her. Now, she's believing God for a husband. So God's working on a husband for her, right? I'm not saved. But God needs to work on me for salvation. I need salvation, right? I'm unsaved. He doesn't have a mechanism in me to talk to me spiritually. All I'm moving on is what I can feel, hear, see, taste, and touch. So to get my attention, to get me to the church, he has to send me something I can see. It's fine and light and almost white. Go ahead. And so I saw her. <laughs> I saw her and because I'm unsaved that's all God had to work with so I saw her she brought me to church I got born again now that I'm born again I can, God is no longer dealing with me in what I can see, feel, hear, taste and touch how do I know? because I was in church for a year about almost a year and I was up at the church cleaning, and then the Spirit of the Lord spoke up on the inside of me and says, now I want you to marry her. See, he didn't give me that out here, marry her, that came in here after I got born again. Now, what am I trying to say to you? Back to this, this same example. You're saved. There is a mechanism in you for God to talk to. And so when you keep on talking about that's not my type, you're based it on a sexual, physical attraction, which is completely wrong because God could be talking to you about this. This is what you've been praying for. This is what you've been asking me for. Here it is. Now, it may be not be wrapped in the package that your flesh wants. Now, follow me on this. How many of you have looked at something before and be like, man, I don't think that tastes good. I don't think I'm going to ever like that. I, and you, don't, you didn't try it. Your perception was that's terrible. I don't like it. I don't think I would like it, so you never tried it. And then one day somebody slipped it in there and you ate some of it and said, hmm, this is good. Man, I think I like this. And you started eating it all the time. What happened? Your perception changed. The same thing is true with your type. The problem is you keep on being led by your flesh and you're going to keep on being missed. You're going to keep missing the very thing that you're asking God for because you keep judging it based on your sexual, physical attraction that you forged out there in the world instead of listening to your spirit, get over here and get treated like a queen, get treated like a king, and I guarantee you that perception will change. 
this will become your king. And every time you see him, you will see the, 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 the road petals will fall from the sky for you because you found your Casanova. But you keep passing over your Casanova because they don't look like, smell like, or think they don't what you want them to be. And I think that that's the dumbest thing because I have sat and I have watched people pray and ask God for things. And then they show up. And then people just look at them and just throw them away like, nah. And then you look later on and they dating this thing that came up out the sewer. And you know it's not going to work because you can see it. They not seeing it, but you see it. And I was like, how did they choose that over God? How many times do you think God going to send you a Casanova, send you uh, your Juliet, and you keep turning them down saying, no, I don't want them? Because they don't meet your physical flesh desire that you forged out there in the world in perversion. See, we got to get this stuff together and learn how to be led by your spirit. Because the very thing that you keep talking about, ain't my type, may turn out to be the best thing you could have ever uh, found. God could have, it is your gift wrapped up in a bow and you keep telling God no. That's, that's, that, we got to get past that, folks. And like I said, when I met her, all I had was what I could see, feel, hear, taste, and touch because I wasn't saved. But when I got saved, God didn't. God does not talk to me in those conditions anymore. I have to hear it now by the Spirit. And when it was time for me to get married, he said to me through the Spirit, marry her. And so now you're looking for God to talk to you guys through, through he's talking to you through your Spirit. And he's giving you what, he's giving you the best thing that you could ever desire. Quit judging the books by the cover. Listen to the Lord and give it a chance. You don't even know if you're going to like it or not because you automatically turned it down. Okay, so just for the record, I ain't going to never in my life let you forget how God used me to save your life. <sighs> I ain't sharing no and witnesses. witnesses. <laughs> yeah, we should have been. Oh, we did record. Okay. All right, so this last thing, and then we're going to open it up for questions. How does the Holy Spirit talk you through the decision? Because most times people are looking for yes, no. You know. So John 16 and 13. And, you know, would y'all like my notes? I can print them off and make them available, okay? I'll make my notes available. John 16 and 13. But when he, the spirit of truth, that's important, He's the spirit of truth comes. He will guide you into all truth for he will not speak his own message on his own authority, but he will tell whatever he hears from the father. He will give the message that has been given to him and he will announce and declare the things that are to come that will happen in the future. He will show them to you. So it's all, so when the Holy Spirit talks to you, he gives you the full picture of, he doesn't make the decision for you. That's, that's important to know. He does not make the decision for you. You make the decision, he provides the information. So he'll give you the whole gamut of that person. He'll show you the and depending on depending on how prayed up and all that you are, it really don't take that long. But you know, some of you may take a little longer to come to that if you would stop rationalizing what you see. You see what you see. It is what it is. Amen. Was this helpful? All right. Any questions?